with our songs just said we need to be ready want to want to be ready to meet the Lord in the glory land this day is coming and it lies before us and we will have an opportunity to do that meet the Lord I think all of us know that we've had a relationship with the Lord that the Bible says it's just a faith relationship it's not something we can see we can read and study about it but sight is not one of those things but we want a relationship that is more than faith. We do want that sight relationship. And we're looking forward to that day. One of the things that uh, probably mark the Lord's Church as different from other religious groups is the idea of whether or not we should use instrumental music. It's been some time I've brought this up in sermons before, but it's been some time since I've preached a lesson devoted to that idea and it's explaining. I hope if you're younger in the audience, whether younger in the faith or just a young person in this congregation, I hope you will listen to this sermon and try to understand the reasoning behind this. Not just, uh, you know, well, that's what we do because we just decided not to have it. Uh, you know, you understand as a Christian, there are a lot of things we're against. But what we don't want is a religion that's just all about being against something or all we're ever thinking is, well, I'm just against it because it's, it's new or whatever and I just don't like it. That really doesn't have anything to do with instrumental music and why it's used or not used. And I wish you'd think on the things that I talk about tonight and see if this isn't the case and if it is not so. Uh, we understand in a general sense that God has commanded that we worship him, and I'm going to use a generic term there of music. We are to worship God with music, and there is a rich, full history of this as you go through the pages of God's word. As you go through it and talk about it, you understand, first off, and I'm kind of broadening out there for a minute, we are to approach God and worship certain ways, and we couldn't even begin to name all of it this evening, but do you remember that we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that it involves our heart, and minds, and our souls, and it also involves the standpoint of not only the truth of God's word, but also the truth of our inner spirit, that is, that we are practicing it with a true spirit, not just a hypocrite of some kind. Notice he says that we must worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and that's what the Father is seeking such to worship him. That's what it's all about. Those who worship him must, must worship in spirit and truth. So that's a guiding principle of worship. Also, we understand if you're going to offer any act of worship to God, it has to stand on the basis of faith. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that faith, that by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Faith was at the heart of the difference between the kind of offering that Cain had and the kind that Abel had. He obtained a witness of God because of this. And then a third thing is that we offer to God our worship and reverent holiness, and we kind of got a negative example about this, but there's a story in Leviticus 10 about two men, Nadab and Abihu, were brothers and the sons of Aaron, each took a censer, they were operating as priests, each took his center, censer and put fire in it, and he put incense on it, but he offered profane, that is a strange fire, a, a fire that was not normally used in the tabernacle service. He offered that before the Lord, which God had not commanded. That's one of the first big cases in the Bible where somebody tried to worship God and offer to God that which God had not commanded. Fire went out before the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near to me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. And Aaron held his peace about that, even though he's watched as his sons died. Listen to that and think about it. The Lord expects anybody that would come near to him to operate out of holiness, to reverence and respect God and know that God is holy and that we need to reverence that. And part of that is understanding that God 
will explain what he wants in worship, and then we must act upon it. That God's word has spelled it out. That was the case here. And he says that God always has to be regarded as holy in anything we do, and that never ought to build in us some type of liberty to go beyond the teaching of God's word. With those in mind, and thinking about the, the, the idea of approaching God in worship, let's talk a little bit further about the principles of acceptable worship before God. And I want you to go especially to Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, and understand worship is regulated by God. Jesus is talking here, and he speaks of the fact that the ger generation before him, like others, were acting as hypocrites. And he said, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, this people draws near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There's really two principles involved in this. It's kind of what Jesus said there a few minutes ago, spirit and truth. If you notice there, what, what's missing? Their heart is far from me. So one of the things that, that they're hypocritical and worthless about in their worship is their hearts are not where they should be in regard to their service to God. They honor with the lips, but the heart is not in there. And he adds, in vain they are worshiping me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So they are teaching things that I never, in one sense, uh, that's an eternal problem, in other words. They weren't worshiping with their hearts. You might say the idea of drawing near to God in spirit and truth. That's the heart problem, not in spirit. And they're not operating out of the truth because they are teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. Now that's got to go across the board in explaining what's acceptable to God in worship and what's not. He's just said, in vain, they worship me. That means they are worshiping, but there's emptiness about it, and it really doesn't accomplish anything. It's a vanity behind it. <clears throat> God alone has the right to decide what acceptable worship is. That ought to define all understanding about worship. It's kind of like what we said this morning. Do you see it operating in the name of Jesus? Do you understand that to mean that we're operating as we want to and then stamping Jesus' name on it? Or is it that we're respecting <laughs> Jesus Christ and what he had to say? Well, God alone, the Lord alone has this right. We have that example we just studied there a minute ago, and that is we have the idea that God's worship is regulated. Now, God had commanded fire. And this is kind of important to our topic this evening. A lot of people look at the subject and say, well, God has ordained for there to be music in worship. And then they kind of make a leap to that, well, any kind of worship is fine. These guys may have reasoned, I don't know what their thinking was, they weren't regarding God's holiness for sure, but they have, may have reasoned fire is fire. I mean, what's the difference? Where do you get the fire that God commanded or whether you go to a source that God didn't command, it's going to burn the sacrifice. So what difference does it make? And in God's mind, the difference with reverence and holiness and respecting God's wisdom is opposed to their own. And they offered this profane fire. So that shows you God had a regulation, and these men violated that regulation, and it cost them their lives. God had ordained in Old Testament times that there were certain priests that could be priests and others who could not. He said, you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Certain people could operate as a priest, but not everybody could. God had ordained who could and who couldn't. That was God's law on the subject. By the way, that will kind of come up later in our lesson. We also understand that men that really didn't respect God's law felt at liberty to change it and change the nature of God's word. Here is one of the Old Testament kings, Rehoboam. It says he made shrines on the high places, and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Did he have the authority to do that? No. But he chose to do that 
And we just simply see in the story that God had regulated that, and this man came along and violated it, and it was a sinful action for him to do that. That, too, is going to come up a little later in our lesson. Now, I want to set before you some facts, and sometimes I'm not sure we dwell enough on this particular point, but uh, whether we do or don't, this, in this lesson we are. Instrumental music was authorized under the old covenant, <coughs> under the law of Moses. Some have suggested, well, I don't know if it ever was or not, and they just added it. It was authorized. What I mean by that is it was ordained by God to participate in. God set it in motion. In the tabernacle worship, God had so designed it. Look in, in these verses. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. God said, make these trumpets and use them in the calling together of an assembly. God authorized it. God said they should do that. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow these trumpets, and they shall be to you as an ordinance throughout the your generations. An ordinance is a law. This is a part of God's law. This is a part of, of how they did things back then. That's just the nature of things. When they, years later, they came along and they built the temple, and David, as you know, was heavily involved in organizing and planning and, and directing how that would all come about. I want you to notice here in Second Chronicles as it describes this, now this is actually later on as it looks back, but one of the things that's said here is, according to the commandment of David, okay, number one, he admits that the use of the organization and the instrumental music and all of that was according to the commandment of David, but then he adds this, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophet. So what he's saying is, yes, David said for them to do it. But David didn't dream that up. The Lord, by his prophets, commanded this order of worship. The Lord authorized all of this to come into play. This is important to understand. That's what the Lord authorized them to do. This eliminates a lot of reasoning that people have, and that is that they kind of think, well, they just kind of got it started back then, and and God didn't seem to mind, so why can't we start it today? And uh, why wouldn't God accept it today? Well, the problem is with that reasoning is they didn't just dream it up. God says, yes, you may do this or allow them to participate in it. Or at times, even as we've seen, commanded that it be done. Look in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 5. 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments which I made, said David, for giving praise. And we understand, okay, David is saying that, but what did we read? We just got through reading that David said, I did it because the prophets of the Lord said that it could be done. The Lord, by his prophets, authorized it. Look again. David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule come out of the temple. Its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, the place that the mercy seat would sit, and the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and the chambers all around of the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries of dedicated things. Now, keep in mind, one of the things he says as David plotted and planned and, and got all of this together, how did he operate? By the spirit. He operated under the influence of the Holy Spirit as the plans were being made about the building of the temple and all of the organization of these things. Also, for the division of priests and the Levites, for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and for all the articles of service in the house of the Lord. In other words, all of this is associated with what we've been looking at right there. And then at verse 19, it says, All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand. 
So every phase of the temple order of worship was planned by God, authorized by God. God inspired David to tell them about it and write it down and all the works and all the plans and everything that they came up with at that time was planned by God. And you know what? God put that into effect. He allowed them to do it. He commanded them to do it. They could have instrumental music uh, in the house of the Lord and all of that went on. And you know what? For century after century after century, they did it because David, through the Lord's authority, had commanded it. They kept doing it and time didn't change it and culture didn't change it. Nothing happened that made them turn around and say, well, let's just do it because we like it or whatever. They did it because the Lord had authorized it. And thereafter, when you got 170 years later, Josiah is uh, appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the priests, the Levites, whom David assigned in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offering to the Lord as it's written in the law of Moses with the rejoicing, with the singing, it was established by David. So 170 years later, they were operating by what David was authorized to do. 270 years later, in the days of Hezekiah, it says he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with stringed instruments and harps according to the commandment of David of Gad the seer, king seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Think about that. Hezekiah's time, they're trying to reform and go back to the standard that they had seen, and what did they do? They brought in cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. Why did they do that? Were they innovations, or were they adding to what God had commanded? No. That had been commanded of the Lord by his prophets. David had full authority to do that. We understand that. 380 years later, the same thing's going on. Josiah has instituted a reform. He wants them to go back to all the written instructions of David, king of Israel. Do everything like David said because that was authorized by God. 550 years later, we're in the days when they've come back out of captivity, the days of Zerubbabel and Jeshua. And it talks about when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. 600 years after David, Nehemiah and Ezra are operating according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. I don't mean to bore you with all of that, but I just want you to see. Century after century followed, and they all went back and said, we're going to do it like David did. Every time they got away from it, they went back to how David had done it because David had been commanded by the prophets of the Lord. It was authorized. They were doing it because it was authorized. Now the problem is not that it had not been authorized under the old covenant. The problem is that the teaching of Jesus Christ has replaced and superseded the law of Moses and the old covenant law and teaching. You'd have to look no further than an instant at the Mount of Transfiguration and see Moses and Elijah and Peter saying we need to build a tabernacle to all three and the Lord's voice coming out of heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. And then when Peter and the others looked up, Peter, James, and John looked up and Moses was gone and Elijah was gone, but Jesus stood there. Hear ye him. Other passages underscore the same thought. We are told, like in Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4, the law served as a shadow, only a shadow of the good things to come, not the very form of things. The law showed us something about what was coming, but it didn't show us the real, the complete picture. Colossians 2 says the same thing, that the law and all those ordinances, don't drink this, eat this, follow the festivals, the new moon, the Sabbath day, those all were just shadows of what was to come. But really all they were trying to get us to was Jesus Christ. So 
what we really understand is there were a lot of things back there under the old covenant, and they had significance for the time that they were allotted to, the generations they were allotted to. These things were important. The Sabbath day was very important, but that only represented something that was coming. It represented the coming of Jesus Christ, and the rest we'd find in him. And all of those things back there simply served to foreshadow something that finally would come. And then when it came, the old covenant would be taken out of the way and removed and abolished, and that would be the end of it. Hebrews 10, verse 9 says, He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Do you understand the implications of that? That the first has been taken out of the way. The earlier covenant, the earlier commands, all of those things that had been authorized in days gone by, those things are now done away with, and the second the new covenant has taken its place. Hebrews 8, 13 says that old covenant was now obsolete. When he said a, a new covenant, he made the first, the Hebrew writer says, he made the first obsolete. Now what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So we got something to stop and think about here for a minute, and that is, okay, we all agree that under the old covenant, there was the authorization by God's command to participate in instrumental music. God himself through the prophets had said it was okay. Now we're under the new covenant and we understand now we've got a contrast and we've got the difference in first day of the week versus the Sabbath day or tithing versus free will giving and and here's another one of those contrasts, and that is we understand that's what authorized it back there, but we're under a new covenant now, and so the question comes along, what does the authority of Jesus Christ teach about, uh, about this? Anybody that's ever gotten into Exodus or Leviticus and studied at length about the requirements of the old law knows that there are tons of those laws that we are keeping today. As you go through them, they're laborious, and you, you look at all those different things that they said you have to do, and we're not keeping any of those things because we understand we're not under that law. And even the people that want to cling for some reason or another to the law that was against us in some way, even the people that want to cling to that still don't keep that law. Some want to pick and choose a few of its laws to bind upon us. But our question in regard to the worshiping God in music now, what does the New Testament teach us? And in the New Testament period, there is an exclusive thought, and that is singing. Now, really, there was some singing in Old Testament times, we understand. But we also found the authorization for God saying, you can make trumpets, you can make cymbals, you can make this and that. But under the New Covenant, there was an emphasis on singing and what we spoke in song being the main thing. In Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, he says, Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, singing, the speaking we're doing in singing. The melody that's being made is a melody in your heart to the Lord. But all of this has to do with our song service rather than any instruments of music. They're just missing from this context. And all of the emphasis is placed on what we're going to speak. And I tell you, the fact simply is that you can get a trumpet and you can get a cymbal and you can get an organ and you can get a guitar and any number of things and none of those things speak. They don't have the ability. They're innate. They cannot speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. None of those can fulfill this requirement. We see in Colossians 3.16 the idea that this is a teach and admonish process. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, the instrumental music can't teach, it can't admonish. But the focus right there is singing. 
teaching by our song service, admonishing with our song service. James 5.13 underscores the idea that it can be a means, whether in the assembly or out of the assembly, of an expression of joyful thanks to the Lord. Is anybody cheerful, James asked? Then let him sing psalms. Let him offer up that in the praise to God. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about the problem of, uh, of singing and prayer and speaking without people being able to understand what's going on. It's couched in a unique situation there, but the point to get is that in that setting, we have an emphasis placed. And first off, talking about prayer and then singing, he says, I will pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. In other words, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at the giving of your thing, since he doesn't understand what you're saying? That goes back to Jesus' statement, spirit and in truth, and the same thing goes here. We have to understand what's going on. You understand and see he's talking about in a congregational situation. Here we are singing and praising God. If people don't have any idea what's being said, then that's not going to benefit or edify anyone as the context talks about. But still, all that's going on is singing. Well, if the Old Testament authorized the use of instrumental music, where do we find it in the New Testament? How would we go to a passage under the authority of Christ and say, now, back there, God said to Moses, you play these trumpets, and later he said to David, you can use harps and lyres and all these things, but then we get to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has transformed the picture, and we have many things that won't go on from under the old law, and now he comes along and tells us we're under his authority, hear him, so where do we find Christ telling us to play instruments of music? And here's our simple answer. We just don't. We don't find that anywhere. His authority has not granted us that right. His authority has not said so. And then we have other passages like 1 Peter 4.11. If you're going to speak. If I was the gospel preacher or our elders got up and taught or we teach in our classes, if you're going to speak, speak what God's oracles say. That's kind of another way of saying whatever God has uttered, that's what we can speak. Okay, if God under the new covenant didn't authorize this, didn't utter this, am I allowed to speak it? Am I allowed to tell the congregation it's acceptable? No, because we have to respect. And we have to respect the silence that is there. If he is silent on the subject, then we don't need to be speaking for him. This answers a question, and that is, where you've gone wrong, this would be somebody's argument to me, where, preacher, where you've gone wrong is, the Bible, the New Testament, it never says not to do this. It, it never comes along and says, thou shalt not use instruments of music. But that's not the way the Bible authorizes. That's not the Bi way that the Bible does things. We respect silence. For instance, God, when he instituted, and we were talking about the priesthood very early in the lesson, when God came along and said, I want them to be the sons of Aaron, this will be from the tribe of Levi, which Aaron was part of, this is where they'll come from, that's the sons of Aaron that will be the priests, and their descendants in the tribe of Levi that they'll come out of. When God said that, he authorized no other priesthood, did he? You could go from the tribe of Levi, but that was it as far as tribes were concerned. And yet there's Rehoboam, which we read about earlier, and he ordained priests that were not of the tribe of Levi. Rehoboam was in rebellion to God. The whole context there talks about him making idols and places for people to worship other than Jerusalem and all of that. And he, he was, what he was doing was he was instituting a man-made religion. He did not want his people going back. This is when the kingdom divided. And, and Jeroboam was in the south and Rehoboam was in the north. 
and in the north in Israel. He didn't want them going back to Jerusalem and getting together with their old friends and relatives. So he made his own religion. He appointed his own places of worship, his own times of worship, and he appointed priests that were not from the tribe of Levi. Rehoboam didn't have that authority. But I want to tell you something. God never said, thou shalt not have priests that aren't in other tribes. God only said Judah. I'm sorry, Levi. God only said Levi. And the Hebrew writer later on is commenting on Jesus Christ and how we can think of him as a priest. And it says the priesthood has been changed by God. That's a necessity because there had to be a change of law because, verse 13 says, God never spoke of another tribe which man could officiate at the altar. There was only one tribe, and that was the tribe of Levi. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, and he had no right to be a part of the Levitical priesthood, but if we're going to count Jesus as a priest, we can't just change the law. We can't just say, well, I, I, I've decided he can be a priest. God changed the law himself. It's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. This is important. It may not be in your mind, but it's just one of those highlights of Scripture. God spoke nothing. I want to ask the question, if God spoke nothing, what did it authorize them to do? You just do what God said to do, and you don't add to it. God spoke nothing. What God spoke was Levi tribe. God spoke nothing of any other tribe. Therefore, nothing else was ever authorized. Listen to this and take it in. God's silence, God's silence, is man's restraint. It's not our license to act. Amen. If God's being silent about it, if God's ordained it'll be this one, and, and, and then I'm going to be silent on all the rest, then it is not our license to say, well, I'll do it because God never said not to do it. That's a restraint. It says, don't act. Just operate within the realm that God authorized there. Quickly, before our time's up, where did all this then get started? If it's the contention, in other words, that instrumental music was never authorized by Christ, then how is it such a prom prominent part of denominational services in this day and time? Why is this such a big deal? Well, let, I'm going to just show you quick. We're not going to get into a major history, just a few highlights from the, from the second to the fifth century. Of course, the Lord's kingdom being established in the first century, so now second to the fifth century unanimously they rejected it in worship it is said in regard to the singing of the early church there was no instrumental accompaniment this is from a man that wrote a book on church music as Edmund S. Lorenz oh we look again and this is from James McKinnon wrote a book called the temple the church father and the early church early western chant the antagonism which the fathers of the early church displayed towards instruments has two outstanding characteristics, the eminence and uniformity. Now, that's kind of wordy. What's he saying? He's saying, you know how they thought about adding instruments in the early church? You know what they felt about that? They were antagonistic towards it. He says the church fathers, the people that wrote after the days of the apostles throughout the early church, they were antagonistic towards instrumental music. And he says, if you want to know the two things that characterize that, that was vehemence, they were strong against it, and uniformity, they all agreed. It doesn't have any part in the worship of God's people. Well, that's outside sources to the Lord's church. Justin Martyr said of instrumental music, the use of singing with instrumental music was not received in the Christian church as it was among the Jews in their infant state, but only the use of plain song. That's man writing somewhat, but not too long after the days of the apostles.
He said, yeah, the Jews had it, but we don't have it. We don't take part in it. This is quoted by Charles Spurgeon. He says again, musical organs pertain to the Jewish ceremonies and agree to us no more than circumcision. He said, in other words, yeah, circumcision was a major feature of the old covenant, but it's not for us today, and Paul makes that very clear. We're not using that any longer. That's not a religious point to us. He said that's the way musical things were back there. We don't use those things any longer. Let's look again. Go to the time of the Dark Ages, kind of those middle centuries. The American Encyclopedia says Pope Italian is related. It's been told that he was the first to introduce an organ into some of the churches of the Western Europe around 670 A.D., but the earliest trustworthy account is that one is that of the one sent as a present by the Greek Emperor Constantine. Oh boy, I won't even try that one. To Pepin, King of the Franks in 775. So he said it's somewhere between 600 and 700. First time they had anything like that in the church. But and you understand that's that's Catholic churches. But look at the Catholic Encyclopedia. For almost a thousand years, the Gregorian chant, that was their style of singing, without any instrument or harmonic addition, was the only music used in connection with the liturgy. The organ in its primitive and rude form was the first and for a long time the sole instrument used to accompany the chant. So if you put that together with the last fact, then from the time the church started to about 600 A.D., 700 maybe, Nobody even thought about the idea of using any instrument. Then it was introduced, and only an organ was used among some of the churches during that time, and that was placed in by a pope. But even by the year 1200s, Thomas Aquinas wrote, church man, man of church history, said, the church does not use mitten instrument I'm sorry musical instruments such as the harp or lyre when praising God in case we should seem to fall back into Judaism he seems to understand the issue said well, we're not going back under the old covenant we're going to not go into Judaism that's not what we were authorized to do so he understood the idea we don't do that we don't use that isn't it interesting that if you did, went back in time to that time period you would have been the outcast if you dare suggest that this be used in worship to God. But here we are in our century, and people look at us as the outcast and said, how dare you not to use it? But see, for many, many years, that didn't go on. One of the great leaders, and we don't hear as much about this guy as we hear about like Martin Luther and others, but this was one of the big leaders of the Ref Reformation. And as he was trying to restore New Testament Christianity, he went in and took all the instruments out of the churches. This was Wingley. Only thing they would do is sing because he's trying to restore. John Calvin was another great reformer. Now, he had a lot of ideas were off the wall, but he said musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of other shadows of the law. So it just doesn't fit. Now his teaching led to the establishment of things like the Presbyterian Church and others who totally rejected him, but you know, way back when he would have been with us, at least on this point. So come along to latter times and even in the days of the nineteenth century, there was a famous Baptist writer, still very respected by uh, you know by religious people today, and his name was Charles Spurgeon. And Charles Spurgeon had a huge congregation of followers in London. He was Baptist background. And he was commenting on Psalm 42, and it said, Praise the Lord with harp. He said, Israel was at school and used childish things to help her to learn. But in these days when Jesus gives us spiritual food, one can make melody without strings and pipes. We don't need them. That would rather hinder rather than help our praise. Sing unto him. This is the sweetest and best music. No instrument like the human voice. 
interesting because he utterly rejected instrumental music. Bottom line is, I think we just found out where it was from. Men stuck it in. And I guess we can ask the question, well, since they stuck it in along the way, uh, is it acceptable? And the answer is no. And all of these men that we've quoted here at the end kind of saw, now, we don't want to go back to Judaism, do we? We don't want to go back into that. That's representative of that time period. They understood, okay, it had a place back there, but does it have a place under the new covenant? And, and they said a resounding, no, this doesn't belong to anything we're part of. I'll tell you, it was really, you know, probably about 150 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, that it really gained prominence even in a lot of denominations. If you track back and listen to the history of a lot of religious groups prominent today, you would have found that nearly every one of them had a moment in time where it was brought in and a substantial number of people opposed it for a while until it just kind of took over. And I think what we understand is this never was commanded by the Lord Jesus. This is something man dreamed up. I want to say it one more time. Under the old covenant, we saw God authorizing. Under the new covenant, we never saw that. When we were told to listen to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ only authorized singing. And that's why we don't participate in it today. It's not that we don't like to hear drums or guitars or whatever in secular music. It's not that we think a, a, a instrument of music is some kind of tool of the devil or whatever. I guess anything can be. But that's not the point. The point is, what did God authorize for this age? And I think you see that realistically, we aren't the only ones that ever saw this poem problem. Men you know, of the Baptist church have seen it. Church leaders like Zwingli and, and Calvin saw it. But this just isn't part of what we are supposed to be. And it really doesn't belong in the things we worship and serve God with today. Well, think on these things, kind of tuck them away, and there's some things to think about so that we know. And, you know, that it's just also a, it's the big issue of authority and understanding and remembering what we're authorized to do and not authorized to do in our day and time. We're about to sing our song of encouragement, and we'd ask you if you need to make a public response in baptism to put on Christ or in uh, uh, repentance to, to get your life straight with God, having strayed as a Christian, we'd call upon you to do that at this hour. Come back to the Lord and be faithful. While we stand and sing our